Today we are honored with three truly uniquely uh, talented participants. Angela Hewitt, perhaps the foremost interpreter of Bach's solo keyboard music, particularly on the piano. She's brought Bach to more people and more people to Bach than anybody since her Canadian competitor, Glenn Gold. Competitor, excuse me. That's okay. Compatriot. <laughs> Compatriot. <laughs> Good start, Hal. Uh, Start. Glenn Gould. Yet for all his talent, what we seem to remember most about Gould is his decision to retire from public engagement in the concert life unusually early. That alone lets Angela stand apart from Gould because she has built and pursued her career specifically with public engagement, with self-initiative, with can-do momentum. She approached and started her own 10-year recording cycle of the entire solo keyboard literature of Bach without a recording contract in hand. And today, that monumental achievement stands as a testament to her graceful and powerful uh, interpretive talents. She established her own summer music festival at Trasimeno Umbria in Italy. She has uh, written and presented her own video lecture series highly intelligent and absolutely invaluable on Bach performance on the piano. She has established her own website and maintains her own blog to stay in contact with her many, many followers. And after she had prepared the 48 preludes and fugues of the well-tempered clavier and memorized them, she then spent the majority of 2007 and 2008, I've been told, on six continents performing perhaps over 200 concerts. She takes our ears into Bach. Matthew Halls, most of you already know him quite well because of his recent appointment as Helmut's successor. Like Helmut, he began his career as an organist and harpsichordist, and already he's established himself as a leading conductor of early music around the world. He has been on faculty at Oxford for five years, his alma mater, as a Harpsichordist, he continues to perform the Goldbergs and other works in the UK, in uh, continental Europe, and in the United States. I have to say, in his recent uh, uh, performance of the Tippet, uh, A Child of Our Time, which I missed, I've heard it said by all accounts it was a powerful, moving, and definitive performance here earlier uh, at the festival. Third, Tim Smith. Formerly Tim's day job is professor of theory uh, in the School of Music at Northern Arizona University. But his all-the-time job is bringing the beauty and the compositional uh, brilliance of Bach to the digital generation, those who largely are not here today. <laughs> As a professor, you can imagine him in the classroom doing that job, but he's also been the editor of the Journal of Music Theory Pedagogy. And today, we're here to uh, enjoy and witness his groundbreaking work in web-delivered multimedia animation and annotation of scores, all to present box music. Previously, his well-tempered clavier site and his uh, Canons and Fugues um, has garnered 6.2 million individual page views from 2.2 million individual visits to that website. That's bringing Bach to the audience. For the, his recent work, his dedicated work on the Digital Bach Project, with really no outreach, we've had 30,000 uh, individual page hits to the uh, B minor, uh, the first installment of the Digital Bach, from 20,000 uh, unique visitors, emanating from 103 countries. To get a taste of this outreach, I encourage you to visit the Digital Bach Goldberg website. See how he takes the three initial uh, Bach monogram and explodes it into a radiating wheel that can, uh, that can present each of the variations in their very specific structural fingerprint or signature. Read his engaging and well-argued uh, speculation on why Bach even wrote the Goldbergs, and especially his comments on why the quad libet and right at the end? Or for fun, read his uh, wonderful scene painting about the Bach family around the harpsichord. 
Artists and advocates, all three of them, passionate and inspired. Let's hear their views on the Goldberg Variations. I'd like to start uh, by dividing the dialogue into three parts. First, the piece, the Goldberg Variations themselves. Second, the performance of the piece. And then third, personal reflections on the Goldbergs and Bach in general. So in the first section, we rely primarily on Tim with ad-lib comments from Angela and Matthew. In the second section, we'll uh, rely exclusively on Angela and Matthew while we talk about uh, the performance. And then for the third section, we'll return and include all three to address their personal reflections on Bach. In purely sensory terms, when I think of the Goldbergs, I think to know the Goldbergs, it is nearly impossible not to give them a 10 on some hedonic or pleasure scale. But to appreciate the underlying architecture and formal structure of the Goldbergs can leave you simply speechless at how they embody Bach's compositional brilliance. So Tim, will you introduce us to the architecture and the formal structure of the Goldbergs? I would be glad to. Thank you, Hal. Uh, but first. I would like to say how delighted I am to be part of this panel, especially <clears throat> in the company of the distinguished co-panelists Angela Hewitt and Matthew Halls, for whose performances of the Goldberg Variations I have great admiration. It is also an honor to be responding to the distinguished moderator, Hal Hinkle, who is not just a great friend and patron of the Oregon Bach Festival, but also a scholar in his own field of cognition and well-versed in the literature and history of J.S. Bach. Now to the Goldberg Variations. What we call the Goldberg Variations was not Bach's title, which you see up here. He called it an aria with diverse variations for the clavier with two manuals. I will assume that the story of how it became the Goldberg Variations is common knowledge. The work was published in 1741, nine years before Bach died. In the last decade of his life, Bach became increasingly preoccupied with establishing his legacy. He began, for example, to organize his own work, the musical works of his famous ancestors, and to create a genealogy of the Bach family. This decade of summation culminated in completion of the Mass in B minor, reworking of the St. Matthew Passion, composition of the Art of Fugue, the musical offering, the so-called Great 18 Leipzig Chorale Preludes, and the second book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Among these works, now acknowledged as the highest expression in each genre, the Goldberg is clearly a part. Today, the Goldberg is recognized as the greatest harpsichord variation set of the 18th century. Of the many reasons, let's consider three. First is the theme itself, which at 32 bars is unusually long. But in a close hearing, it actually contains a recurrent pattern of eight pitches that is recycled across four phrases, each in a new key. Please look at figure four to see the mini theme of the Goldberg's longer theme. Interestingly, Handel had earlier set nearly 100 variations to this very melody, but without nesting or modulation. And I have a little object lesson for you. This eight note theme that you see in figure four is the same as Handel's theme for these nearly 100 variations. But this is what Bach does with it. He takes that theme and makes H prime, H double prime for phrase three, H triple prime for phrase four. Of course, there have to be some tweaks in there to get the uh, modulations to the various keys. So while Bach's theme can be heard as a tribute to Handel, he quantumly outdoes Handel in the process. Before we leave it, one more note about this theme. It is in the bass, and not the usual soprano voice. It is also very difficult to pin down. We are accustomed to calling the first movement, which is the aria, the theme. But Peter Williams calls it the first variation. There is a sense in which the theme does not emerge until one has heard the variations, which leads me to conclude that they make it and not the other way around. The amorphous quality of this theme is one reason why it is so profound, and also why the aria must return at the end so that we can recognize it finally as theme. Secondly, the Goldberg is great for its architecture in threes. 
Variations that are evenly divisible by three are canons, with a quotient being the interval between the canon leader and follower. Thus, variation three is a canon at the unison, and variation six is a canon at the second, variation nine at the third, etc., all the way up through a ninth. This melding of canon, a contrapuntal form that tends toward asymmetry with the symmetrical binary form of each variation is pure genius. For Bach uses the strengths of one to moderate the deficiencies of the other. It is not just the canons that come in threes. Each canon is preceded by a virtuoso piece, which is in turn preceded by a genre piece, which is often a dance, but also includes a full-blown French overture and fugue. With one exception, Bach stipulates that the virtuoso variations are to be played on both manuals of the harpsichord, an unusual directive for the period. Bach probably chose this French-style instrument, which was comparatively rare in Saxony, because the keyboardists of his day did not have the technique to play such difficult pieces on one keyboard. But as we shall see tonight, that problem has been solved by the talented and lovely Angela Hewitt. <laughs> Finally, the Goldberg is great for its sheer imagination and inventiveness. Please see figure two. Normally, composers adhere to the meter of their theme. But Bach varies the meter, as would Brahms a hundred years later. When it comes right down to it, the object of variation for Bach is not limited to the humdrum of melody, mode, and rhythm, the usual fare for his day. He pushes the envelope to strange and daring keys, chromatic harmonies, meters, and, most importantly, an encyclopedic catalog of styles, forms, genres, and dances. When it comes to Bach's contrapuntal imagination, the dashing toccatas surpass even the canons for their inventiveness and fun. Well, the time has come for me to stop, and I haven't even touched upon the 1974 discovery of 14 more canons that Bach added to the Goldberg, probably in anticipation of a second edition. But let me now pass the torch to one of my co-panelists. In sum, Bach's Goldberg has earned its singular place in the repertoire for its clever theme, the counterpoint of its canons, the flamboyant technique of its toccatas, and the encyclopedic variety of its styles, affects, and genres. Thank you, Tim. Before we turn to performance proper, would either of you like to add comments on your perceptions of the structure and how maybe they inform your interpretation? Can I say something? I am fascinated with what you've just said, Tim. And of course, there's always a very great interest amongst scholars and performers about Bach and numbers. And uh, some people tend to shy away from these sort of discussions because they find it somehow takes away from the genius of a great musician. But I think it is very important when looking at Bach. And there are several things that I just wanted to add. You have made mention of the fact that there are interesting threes going on through the Goldberg variations. I think structurally there's also a very big two. And that's at the small level and the large level because the theme is 32 bars long divided into two sixteens. And if you add the two arias at either end, the variations or the complete set numbers 32, and there's a very big binary structural divide down the middle at the end of the open-ended canon and then the French overture that follows. So there are fascinating uh, binary relationships as well. And I just wanted to also add, for those who are interested in this, the fascinating number 14. Um, I'm beginning to sound already like a train spotter, but I, I'm not. But <laughs> I, do, I do find these things rather interesting because Bach attached a lot of importance to the number 14 simply because if you add up the ordinal numbers associated with the letters in his name, B-A-C-H, you get 14. And I think it might not be such a romantic idea that later on in Bach's life with works like The Art of Fugue and also with these wonderful 14 canons that have been discovered, what Bach seemed to be saying with the number 14 and its application in those works was, this is my last word on the subject. This is 
um, this is the end. And I find that quite beautiful, particularly in the discovery of the canons in the hand exemplar. May, may I just add that at the conclusion of those 14 canons, he writes, etc. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I had some fun with a recording engineer trying to reproduce these canons, and actually it's completely unclear in some of them when you're supposed to stop. They could go on ad infinitum. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bach could always, I think, go on, you know, f f to, to infinity. I mean, you get that impression just playing his parodies and fugues. He wrote 48, but he could have written 48 more. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it is infinite. It is endless, the, the genius there. Uh, I think also when you're performing it, um, yeah, the groups of three are quite clear, but when you start, you really have to have, as in any big work that lasts, a very clear idea of where you're going from beginning to end. And you have to join up those groups. You have to have highlights around the way. You know, if you give everything you have in the first five variations, you're not going to be able to save anything for the end. I mean, you have to pace yourself as well. Uh, and there are there are highlights like the f fifth variation, the, the first one that has the great hand crossing. Hold on, I'm going to take this off. Um, this one. That's the first really hugely joyous and virtuoso one. Um, I always feel at number 13, um, 13, not 14, but maybe if you count the area, that's 14. Um, uh, that something happens. It's the first really sublime one. Until then, we've been quite centered on the ground. You know, he's showing his way. But number 13 is the first one that lifts us, lifts me up anyway, really to another level. It's, it's so beautiful and, and calm and, and just gorgeous writing. Then, of course, yeah, we have this halfway point. Uh, number 15 is um, the first one in the minor, so that's the end of the first half, and he does an extraordinary thing there. Uh, he, the voice is, it's a canon in, in, um, in version, so the bottom, bottom, and then bottom, bottom, bottom. The imitating voice goes up, whereas the original goes down. And the voices move away from each other. And at the end of the 15th variation, we get an open fifth like this. So we, we don't have the complete chord. We don't have the B flat in the middle. We just have this open fifth. And it's really suspended. And as I said the other night when I was playing it in Minnesota, if anybody coughs at that point, boom. So. <laughs> <laughs> And then we have, you know, the longest pause in the piece, really, before the great French overture, number 16. Which is, yes, a marvelous opening to the second half. So, I mean, there, there's method in his, you know, in, in what and how he orders these variations. Then we go on, we go on, we have another great one in minor, number 21. And we end in the minor, and then number 22 for me, I start to see, you know, this is, uh, what do we call it, the home stretch. I feel I start on the home stretch with number 22, because we go back to the major. which is a beautiful moment, I think, the light comes again. Number 25 is the great adagio, the great minor variation, where we are totally taken into another world. Then with number 26, he comes back to his hijinks, and that's the hardest thing to do, because after you've you know, given out everything you have in number 25, and for an extended length of time, it's the longest one, then you've got to play all this incredibly difficult stuff again and gather up your strength to do it. And then we get to on the home stretch and we're there, but that's just to give you an idea of what at least I as a performer, what my goalposts along the way and how I shape the work. Whatever the Goldbergs are to the performer, it has to be a function of the edition you're using. And there are many editions. Still, the editions have to derive from one of two sources, either the 1741, as published, part of the Klavier Übung, or, as Tim was mentioning, the 1974 discovered version of that first printed version, which became, it's reasonably well documented in Bach's hand with many corrections 
on that first printed version, and then the inclusion of these 14 uh, canons at the end. So moving to the second topic, the performance, which edition do each of you use and why? Um, I personally, uh, we were talking about this actually just before we um, came up to the stage, but I use the one which is most familiar to me and the one that I've had since I was a, a young student, which is the Berenreiter edition, the Christoph Wolf edition, which is largely based on the discoveries um, in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Well, not in the Bibliothèque Nationale, that's where it now rests, but on those discoveries with Bach's own corrections. And then, of course, I'm sure we'll come on to it later in the discussion, but then that's the starting point, isn't it? And uh, at that point, I always tend to consult other available editions and collate information and make my own conclusions. And so by the end of uh, the journey, I, I sort of arrive at something which is rather more of a hodgepodge and, uh, you know... Uh, my own edition, in, yeah, you know, in a you way. Have to, you, yeah. No, you have to. I mean, I, I get asked that so often, as I'm sure you do too, Matthew, and you have to have, like, your own edition for Bach. There isn't just one. You, you can't just use one edition. In any case, in Bach, the, he didn't write anything in the score. So, I mean, hardly anything. He wrote the occasional temple marking. But... Um, uh, but, yeah, so you have to make up your own. And any Bach performer worth his salt will collect several. In fact, you can't just have one Bach box on your shelf, you know, <laughs> it rather extends. And you look at all of them, you look at the, you know, the many of the more modern ones have wonderful notes about all the different sources, so you decide which version you want to do, especially with something like the Book 2 of the Well-Tempered Clavier, where there's no manuscript, just all these copies with extra thing, the things that Bach wrote in all the time, or his students. So you really have to make up your mind about a lot of things. And then, of course, the dynamics and the articulation, a lot of that will be your own, because he didn't write anything. But that doesn't mean you don't do anything. So, you know, so much more, hopefully not. Uh, there, there, was, there was, what, 50 years ago, a school of thinking, right. that's what he didn't write anything, so, and so you don't do anything. But thank God that is gone. And I just want to... This is my edition of the Goldberg. I was 16 years old, and my teacher um, um, got the score for me, I think. It, it was, it's the Schirmer edition. I never use Schirmer, but Schirmer is actually very good for the Goldberg. It's, it was done by Ralph Kirkpatrick, and he has uh, some nice notes, but this is totally falling apart. I'm going to have to scan it and put it on my iPad now, because <laughs> every time I open it, I lose bits of it. But what was nice in that edition is that for the canons he, and, and, and many of the variations where there's so much hand crossing, he writes out the voices on uh, different staves so you can see them clearly. Uh, and that's a help to, you know, the, the student or learning it or just to anyone interested because otherwise it can be quite complicated to see. And that was also something they did anyway in Bach's time, didn't they? Like, I mean, the Art of Fugue was written out in on four score. different in yeah. open score. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, so there we go. But of course, one ha as I say, one has to consult many different editions. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, both of you have written and commented on the importance of dance rhythm and form in the Goldbergs. And uh, I wonder if you would either comment or illustrate about how a broader appreciation of specific dances from the period help inform your interpretations of the Goldbergs. Well, um, I... I suppose one of the things that most attracted me as a performer to the music of the Baroque period initially was uh, the nature of these infectious dance rhythms that seemed to permeate so much of the orchestral, the vocal, choral repertoire. And we shouldn't be in any way surprised by that because, of course, the rise of instrumental music in general is inextricably linked to the popularity of dance. And, and uh, I suppose... The relevance of dance forms to the Goldbergs is on two levels. Um, some uh, dancers are explicit and easily uh, identifiable. Uh, for instance, it would be very hard to argue otherwise that this is essentially uh, in the aria theme a variation on a French Sarabon tendre, the very um, expressive and slower form of Sarabond with its gentle agogic weight on the second beat of the bar. There are, however, other movements in the piece, also in triple time, where one has to make decisions as a performer as to whether that is a passe-pied 
or whether it might actually be a minuet, or whether in fact it's a, more of a genre piece and we're, we're misinterpreting it if we go down a particular line. So some of it is clear. We, we, we definitely are dealing with uh, a Sarabond in terms of the thematic material. And then there's that lovely moment in Variation 26 when you have the dotted figure in one hand, the tam, ta tam, against the rolling sex tuplets in the other hand. And that is, for me, an important moment in the piece because you are once more reminded of the underlying dance rhythm structure. And I always find that a very beautiful moment where you can hear that clearly again. But, uh, of course, it's not the only influence in these uh, movements, and one has to be careful, I suppose, to choose whether you want to interpret it as a certain dance or whether, in fact, it's something more ambiguous. Yes, I would agree with all that Matthew says, and uh, it's actually it's even more prominent in the well-tempered clavier that you know you get minuets and bourrées and gavots and jigs and galore in the well-tempered clavier. Of course, it's not written there, but it's really quite evident when you know the char rhythmic characteristics of each dance. Uh, in the Goldberg, perhaps it, it is less evident, but you know, number seven, I think in the in the later, not in this edition, but in the later one, it was written in the tempo of a jig, of a jig right? Yeah. That's the one. That's the one, yeah. Some people play it super fast, and others prefer to treat it as a sort of poetic French clavecin piece. In the steel <laughs> brise. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to think of it, well, it's not quite a passe is it? Because, first of all, it doesn't have the upbeat, you know, which you, a passe a real passe is this. Yeah, not quite I, so. I, that's certainly what yeah, I feel, but good. I've heard people differ. <laughs> yeah, well, but, um, but I think box music always, no matter what you're playing, always has to have that feeling for the dance. You have to, at least I always try to choose a tempo that, where I feel that I could express the music in, in a dancing way. Uh, and, and it's also to do with stress, isn't it? You, know, not, you don't have every beat on the ground, it's down, up up, down, up, up, whatever, or you know, if, even if it's in four time and two time, whatever, down, up, down, up. There always has to be this buoyancy to it, and that's what gives it the life. So it's, I think, just all of his music really is so, um, except for very, very sustained vocal things, but all of it has this inner life that's related to the dance. Thank you. For more on this topic, you should really see Angela's video lectures, it's really illuminating when she talks about dance and dance rhythm and interpreting them. The piano and the harpsichord are very, very different instruments. The harpsichord has the advantage of two manuals and the piano has the advantage of its full dynamic range. But in the Goldberg Variations, given their canonic and contrapuntal backbone, it seems there's no choice to achieve a successful performance without the clear expression and articulation of all the voices, irrespective of the instrument. So, I wonder if each of you would either comment or illustrate what you have to do to achieve the articulation of the voices, specifically on your instrument. Okay, well I want to start by saying, uh, and, and sort of blasting a common misconception, which is the idea that somehow as a musician you are restricted when there isn't, because of the nature, technologically speaking of the instrument, a dynamic range. I think I'm always reminded of what Bach said to his own students. He was well aware of this limitation on the harpsichord, and he advised all of his students, in fact, to start work as soon as possible on the clavichord, which, although, of course, one has to sort of bend one's ear and listen incredibly intently to this instrument, it is capable of dynamic expression. And before the development of the early forte piano, it was the only keyboard instrument that was actually capable of such dynamic inflection, as well as an expressive device known as bebung, with a gentle shaking of the finger or an adjustment of the pressure, one is able to actually create a vibrato effect on the keyboard. And I find it fascinating that Bach said, first of all, explore the expressive and dynamic possibilities of the clavichord, 
and then use your imagination. I mean, I'm filling in his missing words here, but essentially what he was trying to indicate was that you then are in a position to try and imitate those effects on the harpsichord. I feel so happy when I hear these variations played on the pianoforte and so happy when I hear Portland Baroque Orchestra play them um, in an orchestral setting because, of course, one of the things that you can't do on a harpsichord is to give these wonderful phrase shapes, to, particularly to the canons, where you can identify and hear the individual polyphonic strands much, much more clearly. And so I feel... I, I try and forget that when I'm performing it myself on the harpsichord, and the ways in which I'm attempting to create illusions is always through the length of the notes rather than the attack or the approach to the keys. So the primary concern that one has as a harpsichordist is to try and find the way of articulating phrases and of creating phrase shapes by note length because that is the only means possible in terms of articulation open to, to, to the harpsichordist. But the thing, of course, that you can enjoy more I think, from the experience and the tactility of playing these variations on the harpsichord is the extraordinary clarity with which those lines emerge, albeit at the same dynamic level. One does, of course, have the possibility of alternating the registration as one goes on the journey through the variation set. But that is also limited. Uh, but I remember a, a really important moment at about the same time that I released my recording. A far, far, far more distinguished keyboard player by the name of Andreas Steyer released an extraordinary recording of the work on a giant German harpsichord with uh, the full range of registers, including 16-foot sound, really very deep registers and, and, and much, much higher than a standard harpsichord. And of course, we know that those instruments were in Germany at that time. We tend not to hear them very much these days. They're incredibly difficult to cart around. And uh, I mean, it, it, but it, it is a, opening a totally new world to the Goldberg variations and one which is very different to the one that I've been familiar with. He has much more possibility for color and for dynamic range. But I suppose it swings and roundabouts, isn't it? I mean, what, some, some you lose, some you win. And um, I think that's the fascination with whichever keyboard instrument that you choose to play Bach's works on, is you respond to the challenges of the instrument. I, I wanted to ask Angela a question, actually, because it's always one that fascinates me. And, and we have to do something on the harpsichord, which is really, um, I suppose, quite central to the technique, which is the use of finger legato mm -hmm. in order to um, create a cantabile and to create a, a sound. And I suppose, you know, when, we, when harpsichordists were doing this in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was pretty much the equivalent of the sustaining pedal and of creating sound. Frescobaldi always says, never leave the instrument empty. Fill it with sound. And this means you play with an almost like glue touch on the fingers. Not all the time, of course, but it's one way of achieving cantabile. And I wonder whether that, inf that, that knowledge influences you when you play it on the piano in, in the use of the sustaining pedal as well. I am always talking about finger legato in master classes. I spend my whole time talking about finger legato. I'm an organist's daughter, so I was taught finger <laughs> legato from the time I was three years old, you know. So finger legato is when you, you know, to, to, get, to get the line you want, you maybe put down the third finger and then you silently change to two so you've got an extra finger free to play the other notes so but most pianists just use the pedal and, and they don't they never think about 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 having to do that so I, I work out it yeah as a harpsichordist would or an organist I work out all my fingering without the pedal even in Beethoven even in Chopin you know it is a totally different way of playing the piano totally different sound a shape to the phrase I just can't stand pianists who don't who don't work you know, that way. It, it just makes no sense to me. So we're really in agreement <laughs> in that. It, 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 it's night and day, the difference. So, I, and I was interested in what you said about how clear box music is anyway on the harpsichord, even though there's just basically the one sound. But it, he was such a genius that when you play, and I, I, I've never played the harpsichord in public, but I, I always run to one if there's one in a room. In fact, at the Berlin Philharmonic a few years ago, I was, I was given a practice room, and there was a Bussendorfer, and there was a harpsichord, and I had to relearn the fourth partita in a few days. And the Bussendorfer wasn't a very good one, so I sat at the harpsichord, and I re relearned the whole thing on that. And it was interesting to me to see that in the way I played, I really wouldn't have to change all that much to make it sound, you know, sound on the harpsichord too because of the way I play, but I enjoyed it. But then what upsets me is that I can't play two notes and 
and play the second one, you know, the na basic musical gesture. You simply can't do that on the harpsichord. No. So, so that, that, that after a while, then I have to go back to the piano. <laughs> and again, Bach and his articulation, as you were saying, it reminded me, I'm always saying how, you know, he wasn't stupid. If he had a subject and a counter subject, like in the well-tempered clavier, he would contrast them so that by choosing different articulations, they would be brought out more. The example I always give is the famous C minor fugue from the first book. They all do. Well, so many do that. But then the mind is confused. But he, you know, he really did choose contrasting subjects, and so that was one way I think that he managed to put them together so cleverly. But um, so articulation and yeah, sound are so related. And you'll hear in the canons tonight how, especially in the first one, the third variation, the voices are um, are really on top of each other because it's a canon at the unison. So it starts like this. You can do that. Of course, it takes a lot of extra work, you know. And, and, <laughs> and I could work for a lifetime and never achieve that on the harpsichord. <laughs> and in some variations, where is it number 17? If I do it correctly, I actually have two different fingerings for a passage because on the second time, I want to bring out more of the, the six in the right hand. The first time I do this, and I bring out the left hand. And... But it's worth it in the end, and that way, then on the repeats, you hear something different. I hope you will. Yeah. Uh, th that's an excellent segue into the next question, which almost started when we were talking about the issue of symmetry and the numerical structure in, in the Goldbergs, and that is that every variation is expected to be repeated. Not a literal repeat, it's more of a nuanced restatement, which requires the artistic interpretation. I wonder, Angela, if you either want to say more about the repeats and Matthew as well, what, did, what is your thinking process when you have to decide how close to a strict repeat and how far from a strict repeat do I want a variation to be? And then once you've set that treatment, does it hold for subsequent performances? Well, first of all, a lot of people don't do the repeats. In fact, it, in my notes to the Goldberg, I think I wrote wasn't it Buzoni? He, he, well, Buzoni took, up some, took out some variations altogether. He said, this variation can be eliminated. OK. <laughs> and, and, and then he, he advised really not doing the repeats. Glenn Gould never performed it with all the repeats. Uh, I've, when I first learned it, I learned it for a competition where we were not allowed to do the repeats. And anyway, without it's already 45 minutes. And so you know, some concert promoters don't want one program that's an hour and 20 minutes nonstop. So two nights ago in Minnesota, I did two big Beethoven sonatas in the first half and played a version without the repeats, although I always repeat the quad libet. I have to repeat the quad libet. I can't do the last variation. I can't do that without repeats. But, um, but I hadn't done that for years and years, not for 12 years. I had I played it without repeats. But um, sometimes promoters want a concert to last an hour. That's it. You can't do more, so you add some in the canons. But of course, the best is, as I will do it tonight with all, I think, it just gives it a, a different structure, doesn't it? It gives it a completeness somehow. 
I, I find that really interesting because, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm an absolute um, non-advocate of sweeping statements. I can't stand them. And uh, I've been told variously by different mentors and teachers that um, repeats are obligatory in 18th century music. I've also then been told by people who I respect as much that actually that's not strictly the case. I've seen both sides of the argument, but I find that there's something we have to remember as musicians, particularly in a piece like this, which is that if we've been practicing and preparing the pieces for a long period of time, we will naturally as performers feel very different about the repeat process and what it's actually about. It's very easy to forget what you gain in a performance by uh, playing the repeat, because as in all rhetorical structures in music, there is something unbelievably refreshing about hearing an idea at the start, and then maybe in a sonata form, hearing it at its return, and it creates subconsciously even a, a, a sense of balance. Some of them we're aware of, and some of them are explicit. Some of them just work subconsciously, I think. But with the Goldberg variations, I feel enormously shortchanged as an audience member when somebody does miss a lot of the repeats. As a performer, sometimes it's the most terrifying thing because in the Scarlatti-like Esercizi variations, um, I remember performing, I think in your hometown of Ottawa, in 98% relative humidity in a church without air conditioning. <laughs> And uh, I had said to myself that I would play all the repeats, and then within the first seven variations, I changed track. <laughs> and so it was entirely in that sense, dependent on context, I also lost several strings during the performance, and the idea of having to repeat some of those trickier variations was insane. But in general, I think it, I, I feel about this piece and about a lot of 18th century music that the people who are saying that there is a reason for repeating and that it isn't exactly and um, you know the performer shouldn't really have the last say on that it's very interesting mozart as well he, he he sometimes challenges the forms that we all know and he will like at the end of the uh, symphony number no. 40 in the last movement he suddenly puts in a repeat at the end of the piece so you think that it's coming to rest and you expect in a normal sonata form movement that the first section the exposition would be repeated and then the development happens and then the recapitulation works itself out and there's this great moment as you approach the end of Mozart's 40th symphony when you suddenly are taken back on this wave of energy to the beginning of the second section so composers were always challenging the structures that were in place but in this i think it's so clear that the repeats mean something and that they're important to the structure but i think we should also make it clear that bach probably never expected anybody to get up in a concert and play the whole goldberg variation right yeah yeah, uh, yeah. let alone with the repeats <laughs> yeah so so at that point we go home right yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i would rather not hear the repeats if somebody's just going to do the same thing. In fact, I remember being stuck in a concert. I was dragged into a concert hall in a Bach festival in Holland. This was years ago. And I didn't really know what was happening. They just plunked me in the middle of the hall in the audience. And some pianist, I won't say who it was, it doesn't matter anyway, some pianist came out and started playing the Goldberg Variations with all the repeats. And with each variation, it just got worse and worse, and I get, got feeling ill, more ill and more... You know, there's what, you know, you have one piece in your life that you just can't stand here massacred, right? <laughs> and with each variation, I just got feeling more ill, really physically ill. And I, you know, by the time number 10 came along, I said, I've got to get out of here, I've got to get out of here. I said, I wonder how long a break he'll take after number 15. I'm just, and I was in the middle, and I, oh my God. And Tatiana Nikolaeva, another wonderful Bach pianist, she was sitting out on the balcony, I could see her, and she was fooling with her program. And anyway, at the end of number 15, I just said, I don't care, I've got to go out. And so I got out um, and out of the hall, made a commotion, but I got out and I went into the lobby and actually the man who was running this festival was there. He said, what's the matter with you? You look ill. I said, yeah, it's the playing. He said, oh, I know it's a long trip from London. I said, no, not the plane, the playing. <laughs> <laughs> It's, wor it's worth out. also saying that if you referred to the, the legend of the Goldberg Variations, Tim, in your opener, and uh, if, if this story is true, there are several things that fascinate me. The, the, the idea of the young Johann Gottlieb Goldberg and the court harpsichordist of Count Kaiserlink in Dresden, and the idea that he needed pieces to soothe the insomnia of the Count, who was a terrible sleeper. 
And uh, there are several things that I find interesting about this, because if you do the math, uh, the poor young lad was 13 when he had to learn these variations, and that's a staggering achievement. I mean, there's no doubt that he was an incredible keyboard virtuoso later on in his life, but the idea that Bach may actually have uh, written these pieces with that player in mind in that situation, or readapted existing um, um, sketches to, to suit that situation, I don't know. But one thing that I'm sure of is that if Count Kaiserlink did fall asleep in Variation 7, he certainly wouldn't have done all the repeats. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would only add to that that I'm thankful that it's not known as the Kaiserlink variations. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Perhaps a short question to end the third section. Uh, when you're performing in concert, the Goldbergs, is there a particular variation that is a devil, a moment of relief, or a homecoming that creates anticipation when you're not quite there yet, but you're thinking about it? I always, I, I'm interested to compare notes here. I always find uh, the very first variation really difficult. It because is actually, you yeah. have been lured into the world of the, the Sarabande and you have enjoyed the almost sort of four or five minutes of, of, of repose and peace at the beginning of the work. And then Bach launches one into this polonaise. Da da dum, ba da da di 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 da da di di di. And it's an extraordinary moment. And of course, it feels really wonderful in the first few bars. But he writes a couple of bars later on in the piece, which really aren't very nice. I usually play at least one wrong note. In yeah. it. <laughs> There's a, a very, very yeah, rapid yeah. jump down to an I F sharp with the right yeah. hand. And it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a little too close for comfort. I've so been I... working on that for 37 years. <laughs> <laughs> Still the same places after all those years. Exactly. You know. But I always feel as a performer that if I've got through that intact, it's going yeah. to be a good evening at the office. Yeah. Uh, it's usually a good marker, but I, I enjoy it. It's like a launch pad, that piece. Sure. It gets you right into the, the groove immediately, and it, it lets you know whether you've had enough coffee before the performance. But <laughs> I, um, I also really, I think I've already referred to the importance for me of 26, which is the mm. one that comes back with the rolling sex tuplets. I love that. But it's the right. sheer jubilation that one feels when one gets to the quad libet. Yes. And when you hear all those popular tunes and the, thinking about the texts of those tunes, I mean, if I, if I translate here, there are two popular folk tunes that we know. There's one which has the extraordinary text. Um, Cabbage and beets have driven me away. Had my mother cooked meat, I might have stayed a little longer. Well, that's extraordinary. Much, much, longer. much longer. Much longer. Much longer. Much longer. Yeah. And then the other one, which is sort of nostalgic and beautiful, is... Uh, Ich bin so lang nicht bei dir gewest, which means essentially it's a reference to the return of the theme. It's I've been so long away from you. It's time to come back. Come and he combines all these in the individual strands, and I think it's just the most wonderful moment when you yeah. get to that point. He could have been referring to a person as well. But Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> come closer, closer, closer. But uh, no, it is. And, it, and I always think that's a wonderful example of how Bach combines the everyday uh, with the sublime, uh, you know, taking these folk tunes. Let me just play them off for the, for the benefit of our audience. tunes, real tunes, and that he combines, uh, quad libet means as you please, and it's something that they would have, the Bach family would have done around the table over a, at the end of a meal with them when they've had lots of beer and wine, and, and they were all musicians, so they could improvise anything, a four-voice fugue, and they would improvise something on, on these themes. So it's a very hearty, very joyful movement, at the, uh, the, uh, this last variation. And then there is this sublime moment where he brings back the theme as though from another world. And so it's just, you know, the combination of this, uh, you know, incredible mastery and, and of form and inspiration and everything with the everyday. And I think that's how Bach was, anyway. May, may I chime in here? Hmm. Uh, the quad libet certainly has that element of humor, no doubt about it. Hmm. But that first, uh, the, the additional motif that we hear there hmm. is not just a folk song, but it's also a chorale melody that Bach uses, I think, some uh, seven mm -hmm. or eight times in his mm -hmm. cantatas, Vas Gott tut das, mm -hmm. What sure. God does, that is done well. Right. And 
When I hear that, it strikes me a fit of uh, religious devotion, actually. Yeah. And the quote libet itself is a very old style, and in, in, in some senses, mm -hmm. it is the most archaic of all the variations, mm -hmm. almost in the style of a motet. Sure. And, and coming as it does after variations 28 and 29, mm. which are the extreme opposite, more list style of pieces. Sure. But I, I did want to say that the element of humor for me there is mm -hmm. that Bach is quoting Possibly, we've always seen that he quotes Handel. He's probably quoting uh, uh, Fresco, uh, not, not Fresco, Svelink mm -hmm. in one of those tunes, who wrote a wonderful set of harpsichord variations, organ variations, actually. Mm -hmm. And then he's also probably quoting Buxtehude in that second. So I see the quote Liebet as Bach staking his claim and, and, him, and, okay. and making his place in the repertoire of harpsichord literature sure. by quoting, using essentially a rhetorical device, which was well known in his day, which was to work, quote the works of other people. Right. And so we hear, we hear, hear uh, what God has done, that has done well. This is Bach, the God of counterpoint. And he's saying, I've done it well. Right, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> we need to move quickly to our, our last uh, segment uh, with only three questions. The first one is, if you had 15 minutes, sitting alone with Johann Sebastian Bach at his compositional desk. And you could ask him one question <laughs> about, one, about one work. What would that question be, and what would the work be? Well, I'm working on the art of the fugue at the moment. I might have asked him, how would he end it? You know, because <laughs> <laughs> he didn't end it, he died. So I might ask him to write an ending, but uh, no, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, there's so much. Uh, I would just like to hear him play for 15 minutes. That's what I would like. Matthew? Yeah. I'm just going to say, I mean, I don't know how to answer a question like that, Hal. It's extraordinary to, to think. I'm, if I was given another half an hour, I might have some more sensible ideas. But actually, the first thing that came into my head was that... Uh, probably wouldn't want to ask him about his music. I'd probably just be very interested to talk to him about his life. And I mean that because I quite like to leave some mystery in, in music. And, uh, you know, life lifetime spent with Bach's music is, is a communication between composer, performer, and ultimately audience. And, um, yeah, I'd like to know about Bach the human. Okay. Tim? Well... I want to go back to these numbers that you mentioned earlier. I would like to ask him, did you really do that, or are we just uh, making this all up? Uh, but, but another thing, uh, shortly before he died, uh, Glenn Gould said that he had discovered a, some complicated metrical relationship in the Goldberg variations, and I think I have an inkling of what that was about. Gould said it would take him a book to explain it. It would probably take me three books. but. If I just had 15 minutes, I don't know if I dare bring this up with Bach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next, if you could give the autographed manuscript of any one work by Bach to somebody else in your life as a reflection of appreciation or honor or admiration, what would that work be and to whom would you give it? Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn it on its end because my, I'm going to just speak my initial reaction again. Um, I wonder if in the 21st century, actually, one of the things that frustrates me sometimes is the number of great manuscripts and works that lie in private collections and are very, very inaccessible. So I think probably I would expand that and I would say that it might just be time to consider giving back quite a lot of these manuscripts to the public domain. Good point. I don't know. I don't know, really. That's getting quite personal there. You know. <laughs> and uh, what is amazing when you look at his manuscripts, the ones we have, is how clear they are, isn't it? I mean, you know, he was thinking up these amazing fugues and five-voice writing, and yet it just poured forth. It just came out. There, there are not so many corrections. I mean, there are, but it's not like Beethoven or anything. I mean, it just has a, an incredible clarity. And um, so th that's really amazing. I don't know. I'd have to think about that, but that would then I keep the answer to myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, do you dare? I, I do. No problem at all. Uh, my oldest grandson, eight years old, is learning um, the uh, uh, three-part inventions, and I would ask him for the two and three-part inventions uh, signed copy for Isaac, my oldest grandson. And if I said, pre if I said 
pretty pleased maybe he would do five signed copies for each of my grandkids. How's, how's, he might, how's he might write five new ones. For <laughs> so our final question. Uh, would each of you uh, care to offer your personal reflections on what the Goldbergs mean to you personally or specifically in your own career development? Just very quickly, uh, the Goldberg Variations taught me counterpoint, and I will forever be thankful for that. I, when I think about my career, I suppose this is one of those pieces that has been like a punctuation mark throughout my development so far as a musician, and I will always associate my um, performances of this work with time and place, specific places. And I will always remember them as, as very special events and unique events because no matter how hard I prepare as a performer and um, how methodical and I, I am with regards to my analysis and my study of the work before I perform it, I'm always surprised at the directions that I go off on in, in performances which are entirely dependent on how I'm feeling and entirely dependent on where I am in the world and what's going on around me. So I can remember pretty much every performance of the Goldbergs I've ever given, and I will always remember the magic of the place in which it was done. So for that alone, it's a very, very important piece. Yeah, I guess it's the one piece that's accompanied me really through all my adult life, as, as at least no other pieces accompany me as much. I learned it when I was 16, I first performed it then, I won a prize with it when I was 17, and so then, but, but it's also changed with me as I've changed, and that's really interesting to, to see more than any other piece. Uh, I went through a stage when I first went to live in London in 1985 and heard all the early music people, and I played it then I, with different tempi and took out the pedal completely, and uh, then I, you know, then I changed my fingering, a lot of the fingering too at that point. It still remains the piece that when I perform it, it's the most moving piece I think that I play uh, when it really works and, and the piece that I see that audiences respond the most to. I've played it all over the world and everybody gets something out of, out of this piece. It, and many people come to me afterwards and say that it's the closest thing that they get to a spiritual experience to hear, to hear it. So um, in a way it's become my calling card if I go to a new city and, and you know they want a recital for the first time it's often the piece that I suggest but no, no piece I think in my entire repertoire uh, means as much to me as the Goldberg. Mm.